Happy Easter. So glad that you're here with us today. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here. And if this is your first time here, I want to give you a special shout out. Those that have been coming to Shelter Co. for a while, either regularly or infrequently, so glad that you're here with us today as well. I am super excited for our time together. I firmly believe that God's going to encourage your heart in a special way. It is baptism weekend, which is awesome. So we've got people already signed up to get baptized. And maybe you're here today, and the last thing you were thinking about is getting baptized, and we've had people at all of our services. We had a man in our last service to, stood up in the back during our baptism time, took off his sports coat, came up to the front, and got baptized in his Easter clothes yeah. because he was just feeling the Spirit of God moving, which is just absolutely awesome. So maybe that will be you today. Baptism is that first step of obedience after we give our lives to Jesus Christ where we publicly identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Hey, if you're newer to Shelter Cove, just a few things about our church. We firmly believe that every single person is in the need of the grace of God. Second of all, we believe that love has the power to change people's lives. Thirdly, we believe that Jesus can change absolutely anybody. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter what's happened to you. It doesn't matter what you've done. We believe Jesus can change anybody. Fourthly, we like to have fun. So we don't take ourselves very seriously, but we do take God very seriously. And lastly, uh, we believe that truth still matters. So I'm excited that you're here with us today. If you'd grab your bulletins and take out your sermon notes, that would be awesome. Grab your sermon notes, turn those over to the back page, and you've got a list of what's going to be um, happening over the next five weeks. We're starting a series titled, What About? Today we're looking at, What About the Resurrection? And we're going to be answering questions that we have about the resurrection. Over the next several weeks, we're asking questions and answering those. So many questions about faith, life, the scriptures, Jesus. Next week is, What About Science? It's going to be an awesome one. The week after that, What About Pain and Suffering? I think so many people ask, wow, if, if God is a God of love, why is there pain and suffering in the world today? And then we're going to look about what about other religions? And then lastly, what about the Bible? So I firmly believe if you're newer to Christianity or you're still searching that these several weeks are going to be a time where we're asking questions and give you some answers from the Bible that will really encourage your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you've been a believer for several years, I believe that these next several weeks are going to solidify your faith in a powerful way because, again, one of the greatest things we can do is ask questions, but we need to go to the right source to get those answers. So we're going to be going to the scriptures. You know, the, the age of a person that I believe asks probably the most honest, unfiltered, transparent questions is a two, three, or four-year-old. Would you agree? And sometimes those little kids, they ask great, great questions, and sometimes... Oh, they ask embarrassing questions, don't they, mom and dad? Like the one time uh, my daughter, uh, she didn't go up and wonder uh, if, if a woman was pregnant, which is one of those things you don't do in the first place. But we were in Target, and she didn't ask with a soft voice. She asked with a loud voice. She looked up and saw somebody in front of her that, that looked, you know, a little just bigger and said, Hey, Dad, is that man pregnant? And I'm like, oh, seriously? No, you did not just ask that in public. Like moms and dads, how many of you have kids and there's been times where you wish you could just grab your hand and cover their mouth because they asked something that was just offensive or ridiculous. Just raise your hands just for a second. So many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now let's just keep it real for a second. Wives, how many of you have husbands where at times you need to cover their mouth because they ask questions that are ridiculous? Now husbands, I'm not going to even go there because I'm looking out for you today, all right? We're going to have fun today. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28 is where we're going to be. If you don't have a Bible, we have you covered. These verses are going to be up on the screens. And we're going to dive in week one of what about, and we're going to ask the question, what about the resurrection? And as we start, I just want to read the word of God because I believe that there is power in the reading of God's word. Matthew 28, starting in verse one. Now, after the Sabbath... For the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His presence was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. 
And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, in these next several moments, we open our hearts and we ask that you would speak to us. God, if there's any distractions that would keep us from hearing you speak clearly to our lives today, we ask that you would eliminate those now. God, I humbly ask that you would take over my mouth, my mind, and my heart, and that you would proclaim the message that you have in store for your people today. God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What about the resurrection? Before we dive in and talk about the reality of the resurrection, the first thing that I want to establish is the reality and the truth that Jesus truly did die on the cross over 2,000 years ago. Why is this important? Because there are some people that believe that Jesus didn't really die. They believe in the swoon theory that Jesus was just in this coma-like state and that, that, again, he didn't die. And this isn't rational for several reasons. First of all, it's unlikely that anyone could survive what Jesus went through. Not only was he hanging on the cross for hours, but prior to that, Jesus was beaten. He was whipped. He was abused. Flesh was literally ripped off his body. When he was hung up on the cross, a spear was stuck in his side. When they went to break his legs, which is what they did to make sure people were dead, uh, the Romans realized that Jesus was already dead. So it's unlikely anybody could survive what Jesus went through. Second of all, the Romans were experts at crucifying people. That's what they did. They were experts at killing people. They would not make this kind of a mistake because they killed people all the time and sadly enough, as disgusting as it is, they had great joy and pleasure doing so. And if that's not enough, the third reason why is that it is very unlikely that somebody would be able to bounce back a couple days later from something like this. If they did get tormented and abused and were in a coma-like state, they would be incapacitated, not for just weeks, but months. And so with that foundation laid that Jesus clearly did die, the first question that I want to deal with this morning is, how do I know the resurrection really happened? In your notes, there's four reasons. Number one is the empty tomb. Number one is the empty tomb. All gospel accounts reveal that a stone was rolled away. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This is the first thing that the women saw, the first thing that the disciples saw, was that the stone that was originally there covering the tomb was now gone. It had been rolled away. Who rolled it away? The Bible says that an angel rolled it away. It was two to 3,000 pounds showing the, the strength and the majesty of angels. Now, why was it rolled away? Was it because Jesus needed to be let out? Absolutely not. It was an announcement that God in the flesh was no longer in the grave, that he had risen. And so the first evidence that we have is the empty tomb. And if that's not enough, if we read further in Matthew 28, 11 to 15, we see the Jews that did not believe that Jesus was Messiah. They were in contradiction to the Christians they tried to come up with this scheme, this plan that the disciples actually stole the body. Now, why would they do that? Because the tomb was empty. They validated the reality that Jesus Christ was no longer in the tomb. The first piece of evidence that we have is the empty tomb. The second piece of evidence that we have in your notes is the numerous eyewitness accounts. The numerous eyewitness accounts. How many of you just saw that? Okay, if you missed that, let's show up on the screen what just happened. No, we, just, we just, all right, good. Now, what did I just do? Prior to putting that up there, 
I appealed to eyewitness accounts to validate that something just happened. Now, now don't miss this. I am a diehard Dodger fan. So for me to put a Giants logo up on the screens, oh, it shows so much love. That is the love of Jesus, if I've ever heard it. Jesus said to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The original Greek, I believe, reads, love your enemies and pray for San Francisco Giants fans. All right, just keeping it real today. But what did I just do? I just appealed to you, other eyewitnesses, to validate that something actually just happened. How do we know that the resurrection really happened? Because of the multiple eyewitness accounts. Jesus didn't appear to just one person or two or several. He appeared to literally maybe 1,500 to 2,000 people after his resurrection over a period of six weeks. Who did he appear to? He appeared to uh, Mary a Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James. He appeared to the disciples without Thomas. He appeared to the disciples with Thomas. Why Thomas? Why is that so important? Thomas doubted. He doubted the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was somebody that said, hey, unless I see the holes in his hands and unless I can put my finger in his side, I'm not gonna believe. So what does Jesus do? He appears to Thomas and says, hey, Thomas, look at my hands. Hey, Thomas, where's your finger? Put it in my side that you may no longer be faithless. Jesus appeared to numerous people after his resurrection, proving that he truly did conquer the grave. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 to 7 reads this way. Paul said, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers, don't miss that, at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. I love that. What did Jesus do to make sure it was perfectly clear? He appeared to 500 brothers, not including women, not including children at the same time. So realistically speaking, there could have been 1,500 to 2,000 people easily at the same time. We have numerous eyewitness accounts. If that's not enough, we've got writing from Josephus a historian, used to be a Jewish military leader, turned historian. He was an eyewitness of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. He validates and verifies the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of of, of Jesus Christ. He validates that as a Jewish historian. We have the empty tomb. We have the numerous eyewitness accounts. Next in your notes, we have the response of the disciples. We have the response of the disciples. These disciples, something changed. When Jesus was getting ready to be crucified, they were cowards. They scattered. Peter denied Jesus three different times. And then all of a sudden, they become these courageous ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Now, now, now why would that happen? Because they saw the risen Jesus Now, some people will say, you know what? These disciples, they were hallucinating. They were just lying. Well, it's impossible that they were hallucinating. Why? Because of all the other hundreds of people that saw the same Jesus. Oh, they they were lying. You know, there's some people that would die for a lie, believing that it was a truth. But you would not have all of the disciples die for a lie, knowing it was a lie. Something radical happened in their lives. What was it? They saw Jesus. They saw the holes in his hands. They saw the risen Savior. It transformed their life. And if that's not enough, fourthly in your notes, what do we see? We see the growth of the church. How do we know the resurrection actually happened? The growth of the church. Acts chapter 2. Peter's given this message at Pentecost. What happened? Thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Because most likely in that audience, there were skeptics that didn't believe in Jesus. But they saw him with their very eyes after the resurrection. They knew that he was real. They knew that only God could do this. And so you've got people that didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah prior to the resurrection that see him with their very eyes. The church explodes. Thousands of people are coming to Christ. Why? Because skeptics are like, yeah, it was true. I I saw him with my own eyes. He conquered the grave. He was once dead, and now he's alive. What happened to Paul? Why would this guy that was a persecutor of Christians 
become a Christian himself and be ambassador for Jesus Christ because he had an encounter with the risen Savior. I love what Tim Keller says. He's a pastor. He put it this way. He said, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. And what do we have? We have the empty tomb, the numerous eyewitness accounts, the response of the disciples, the growth of the church. Question number two in your notes is this, is what does the resurrection of Jesus reveal? Now, the resurrection reveals a lot, just like a picture, multiple things. In fact, to illustrate that, I want you to look at these pictures just for a moment. What does this picture reveal? How many of you see a young gal in that picture? Raise your hand. A young gal. Good. How many of you see an older woman in that picture? Raise your hand. It reveals two different things. How many of you saw both? Raise your hand. Good. The honor students right now are all raising their hands. That is great. Go ahead and go to this next picture. How many of you see a rabbit in that picture? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you see a duck in the picture? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you see a unicorn in that picture? <laughs> All right, there's not a unicorn in that picture. I just want to make sure nobody was smoking a little something, something before church, all right? Just keeping it real in here today. All right, last one. How many of you see a, a frog in that picture? Good. How many of you see the horse in that picture? The eye of the frog is the nostril of the horse, and it's looking up. Pictures reveal a lot. Some of you are going to be looking at that for like the rest of your life, all right? I'm just going to pray for you. Look, is there really a horse in there? Wasn't there a unicorn in the back one? I'm still looking for that. What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ reveal? Four life-changing things. Number one in your notes, that Jesus is God. Why? Because only God could conquer the grave. What did Jesus claim about himself? He said, I and the Father are one. He claimed multiple times to be the Son of God, which literally means that he's God in the flesh. Now, skeptics will say, you know what, I don't believe in the Bible. Will you take away all of the book, books of the Bible that skeptics don't validate, and you just look at the ones that are embraced by skeptics that are historically accurate in those books, it still says multiple times that Jesus claimed be, to be God. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ validates the reality that Jesus truly is God in the flesh. Romans put it this way, that Jesus Christ was declared the Son of God with power. How did this happen? Paul goes on and says, by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. See, only God is loving enough to die for us and powerful enough to conquer the grave. The resurrection reveals that Jesus is God. Second of all, the resurrection reveals that Jesus has the power to forgive sins. He has the power to forgive sins. Why is this so important? Because the reality for every single one of us, including me, is that because of Adam and Eve and their disobedience and their sin in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, that sin was ushered into the world, that every single one of us were born with a disease of sin. And the greatest consequence of this disease, I'm gonna tell you this because I love you, is eternal separation from God in a place where there is weeping, there is gnashing of teeth, there is pain. It's a place of literal hell. And yet so many people believe that God's not gonna, he's not gonna care about my tiny indiscretions. My lying, my cheating, viewing pornography, it's not that big of a deal in the eyes of God. And yet God is a holy God. And God is a perfect God. So he can't let any little unholiness near him. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to do what we can't do ourselves, and that's deal with the sin issue in our lives. Jesus, fully God, Fully man is the bridge between us and God. And when he rose from the grave, it was proof to every single one of us that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was sufficient in the eyes of God. 
proving that Jesus does have the power to forgive sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 puts it this way, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Because we're either in our sins or in Christ. If we're in Christ, we've got eternal life. If we're in our sins, we're still guilty, still sinful, still in condemnation. So what does the resurrection prove? That Jesus has the power to forgive all of our sin. And it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've you've done it. Jesus Christ on that cross died for our past sin, our present sin, and our future sin, giving us access to a holy God. What else does the resurrection reveal in your notes? That Jesus has power over death. Not only does he have the power to forgive sins, he has power over death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the resurrection in the, in the life. Not only is there life through Jesus, Jesus is life. There is life in his name. There is resurrection in his name. In other words, the same power that rose Christ from the grave is available to us. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus literally comes into our lives and that same power that rose him will rise us as well. Jesus has power over death. Why is this so important? Because Jesus is the only religious leader, the only person that claimed to be God that's no longer in the grave separates him from every single other religion, religious leaders. All other religious leaders died and they're still in a grave. We worship a God who conquered the grave. He's with God right now next to the Father advocating on our behalf. If that's not enough, what else does it reveal? The resurrection of Jesus Christ reveals that Jesus always keeps his promises. He always keeps his promises. Matthew 28, verse 6, the angel said, he is not here, he is risen, just as he said. There is not one promise from Jesus, from God, that he will not keep. What did Jesus promise? He promised so many things. He promised that we can have life in his name, that there is peace in his name. He promised that he will provide for absolutely everything that we need. Why? Because Hebrews chapter 6 says that it's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie. So what is the, the resurrection of Jesus revealed to us? It reveals that Jesus is God, that Jesus has power to forgive sins, that Jesus has power over death, that Jesus always keeps his promises. Now, Lee Strobel a man that was one time an atheist, set out for himself to do the research because he wanted to believe in truth. And so he looked at the the scriptures. He looked at history outside of the scriptures. He got to a point where he just laid out the evidence before him and he said the most logical thing for him to do was surrender his life to Jesus Christ because that's what truth pointed to. This is a quote that he made. He said, in short, I didn't become a Christian because God promised I would have an even happier life than I had as an atheist. He never promised any such thing. Indeed, following him would inevitably bring divine emotions in the eyes of the world. Rather, I became a Christian because the evidence was so compelling that Jesus really is the one and only Son of God who proved his divinity by raising from the dead. It meant following him was the most rational and logical step I could possibly take. I love that. Here's a man that just laid out the evidence and said, I'm going to do what's logically, uh, it just makes the most sense. So question number three in your notes is this one. What difference does the resurrection of Jesus make in my life? And this is where, where it really gets personal. Because at the end of the day, When we stand before God and we give an account for our life, there's a lot of things that won't matter. How much money you made in this life, it's not gonna matter. Your possessions, it's not gonna matter. Your age, your gender, the color of your skin, your ethnicity, it's not gonna matter. What's gonna matter is that you have Jesus. Because when you stand before God at judgment, you will be in one of two places. You will either be with Jesus or without Jesus. And so to ask the question, what difference 
does Jesus and his resurrection make in my life? There's four things in your notes. What does Jesus offer us? What, what can we experience? A new life. A brand new life. My sins are forgiven and I have been given a second chance. Jesus doesn't just allow us to have behavior modification. He comes into to our lives and he changes us from the inside out. He changes us from people that are greedy and we become generous. He changes us from being people that are filled with hate to, to people that are filled with love. Why? Because Jesus literally comes inside our heart and he makes residence in our lives. He gives us a brand new life. What does that mean? That means that Jesus changes our marriages. He changes our family. He changes our relationships. He changes everything. Why? Because he changes us. 1 Corinthians Chapter 5, 17, Paul said this means that if anyone belongs to Christ, he has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. It's a brand new life that's available to every single one of us because of Jesus. Lee Strobel, the atheist, now Christian, put it this way. He said, my worldview, my philosophy my attitudes, my relationships, my marriage, everything has been transformed by my relationship with Christ. What can we experience with Jesus? A brand new life. Who wouldn't want that? Who, who wouldn't want that? If that's not enough in your nose, what notes, not in your nose, that would be weird. Uh, second of all, in your notes, what else can we experience? A peace in my pain. A peace in my pain. Despite the hurt and pain in this life, I know this is just temporary. Jesus said to his disciples in the upper room, he's saying, I'm telling you all this stuff. I'm telling you what's happened. I'm telling you that I'm going to die and I'm going to come back to life and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit after I ascend. I'm telling you all this stuff so that you may have peace. He goes on and says, in this life, you're going to have a lot of trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Why is this so important? Because for some of us, most of us, right now, even in this moment, we're experiencing pain. It could be relational pain, be physical pain, financial pain, some kind of peace. And because of Jesus, we can be assured that this pain is only temporary. Why? Because there's going to be a time when we're in heaven with Jesus that there will be no more pain, that there will be no more suffering, that there will be no more crying, that there will be no more tears. Why? Because we will be in complete peace with God forever because of Jesus. But here's the difference it makes in my own life. Is that right now, it gives me a peace in the midst of my pain. Uh, my son, Jacob, is 13 years old. Some of you know him. He's got severe special needs. He's got a chromosome disorder. He doesn't walk. He doesn't talk. He doesn't eat through his mouth. And there are times, even 13 years later after his birth, there's still times where I just, I just break down and cry because of his situation. But my peace in the midst of that is greater than the pain. Why? Because I know there's going to be a day where Jake is in heaven and that he's not going to just walk. He's going to run. He's going to eat a grip of pizza. <laughs> I'm just hoping to have that in heaven. And friends, that's, that's the peace that I experience, knowing that it's greater than my pain, and pain is just temporary. Thirdly, in your notes, what does Jesus allow us to experience? A confident future. Confident future. Why? When my eternity is secure, I live with great hope. I live with great hope. Confident future. Now, what is hope? Hope is not just wishful thinking. Hope is this confidence. This, it's this reality that, that Jesus has already done all the work necessary for us to have a relationship with God. That despite the curveballs that were thrown in this life, despite the pain, the suffering, the heartache, we know it's just temporary. We know that there's nothing we could ever do to lose our salvation in Jesus Christ. Why? We did nothing to earn it in the first place. I believe that's one of the greatest sources of peace in this life, that Jesus has done all of the work for us to be right with a holy God, and all we need to do is receive him. And when we receive him, again, our sin, the past, the present, the future, is wiped away because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. 
That is the greatest confidence we have in Jesus, not in ourselves. Why? The Bible says that our good deeds are nothing but filthy rags in the eyes of Christ. So this life is not trying to do enough good deeds where we're tipping the scales and pleasing God. This, this life, a life of hope, is about receiving Jesus Christ and being confident of the future. And then lastly, what does Jesus allow us to experience in your notes? It's a personal relationship with God. It's a personal relationship with God. Jesus dealt with my sin, and he gives me access to a holy God. Now, why is this so important? Because there are so many people that know about the love of God. Don't miss this. They know what the scripture says and have never entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Friends, religion will not save you. Your parents' faith will not save you. It's only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that you can be saved from your sin. Jesus said very boldly and clearly in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whoever believes in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. See, with Jesus, the power of his resurrection, we can experience peace. We can experience hope. We can experience freedom from our sin, freedom from ourself. We can experience love. We can experience grace. We can experience all these things. Why? Because at the end of a day, the one thing that's real is that hope has a name. And love has a name, and peace has a name, and freedom has a name, and love has a name, and its name is Jesus Christ. And I hope that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ today. Let's bow and let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the power of the resurrection. And God, it's, it's one thing to know the reality of a risen Jesus it's another thing to experience personally the reality of what that means in our lives. So with all heads bowed, nobody looking around, this is just a personal moment with you and God. If you're here today, and the honest reality is, is if, if you died today, you don't know where you would spend eternity. Maybe you've thought you'd go to heaven because God's just nice and he'll overlook some of your indiscretions. But again, the reality is God is a holy God, a perfect God. He cannot tolerate any sin because of his holiness. And we need somebody to do what we can't do ourselves, and that's deal with the sin issue in our lives, which is why Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for you, to free you from your sin. And if today you want to invite Jesus Christ into your life, that you may have life in his name and a future in his name, you can do that through a simple prayer. It's not the words of the prayer. It's your heart. It's a heart of surrender. It goes something like this. Dear Jesus, I need you. I need you to come into my life and rescue me. I turn from my sin and I turn to you take total control of my life. I want to experience your grace and forgiveness. Today, I want a brand new life that's only possible with you. Today, I receive you. With all heads bowed, nobody looking around, but if that's your prayer today, I just want to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand and look at me wherever you're at? You say, you know what, that's me today. I've never invited Jesus Christ into my life. Raise your hand wherever you're at and just look at me. Good, I see that hand. I see that hand. Good, I see that hand over there. Raise it real tall. Look at me in your eyes. See that hand? I see those hands, this hand, these hands over here. Over here. Who else is there? This is the greatest decision you could ever make in this life. Good, that hand, that hand in the back. Good over here. Again, heads bowed. 
You've got 15 seconds that would change your life. Is there anybody else where today you're saying, I just want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ? Raise your hand wherever you're at and look at me. Good, I see that hand over there. Is there anyone else? Good, sir, I see that hand. Good, those hands in the back. Good, I see that hand over there. 10 seconds. 10 seconds to change your life. Five. Good, I see that hand. Good, those hands over there. Is there anyone else? Last opportunity, Easter weekend, 2018. God, for all those that raised their hands today, be with my brothers and sisters. Fill them with your spirit. Give them a confidence that only comes from you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.